welcome back to the Improving Season podcast. It is me, the healthy and agile Pascal Flor. And on the other end, it is the extremely exhausted and sick bastard from London. It is Steve Hall. Or Paul. <laughs> or Paul, yeah. Paul was actually... Um, so he was well I haven't received. gotten back to all of the comments as of yet. So terribly sorry for that, guys. Uh, but it seems like Paul was very well received last week. I don't know what it is about Paul, but maybe he has a role in the improvement <laughs> season podcast in the future. But unfortunately, he is unwell, as you said, or at least it, it's a bit of a weird feeling. I've been feeling just like ever since the start of this week, kind of a wave of fatigue. And then I guess you feel like you're ill enough times in your life that you'd recognize the lead into the illness. Mm. But like, I was like, oh, why am I so tired? I'm getting like lots of sleep, blah, blah, blah. It's like, because you're, you're getting ill. That's why. <laughs> it's like. Funny thing is that um, once you are ill, right? And you think that the world is just coming to an end. Yeah. <laughs> and when you get out of it, I must imagine that this is reversal out of a contest prep in a, a time span of like one day. Where it's just like, I feel totally shit. Everything is just the the world is coming to an end and next day you feel like holy shit this is actually how i always feel this is just amazing it's funny whenever i because whenever i get ill like this it's like man i'm so grateful for the fact i'm like 99 percent of the year <laughs> yeah. don't feel this way because yeah it freaking sucks um like last year i had like tw uh, twice due to hugo being around that i just yeah. had i don't know what it was but on a one specific day, had fever, needed to lie down and sleep the entire day. And that happened to me twice. And I felt awful, awful. And that, that's not me being a man and complaining about being ill. Like, I just felt awful. I couldn't do anything at all and just needed to lie down and sleep. And the next day I felt like a newborn and I was like, holy shit, this is actually how you always feel. You, you have to embrace that. No, totally. So actually, I guess... That's the the silver lining is how good you feel, how good I'll feel like in a couple of days, hopefully, um, and it will all pass by. But it's not helped me trying to get in calories. I yeah, think. I just want to say probably you're feeling that sick because you're just eating that much. And Doesn't now help. you're actually um, implementing the strategy of mass gainer shakes. So thousand calorie shakes. It's insane. Yeah, I had, what did I have for breakfast? I had a glass of orange, uh, not orange, just juice. A glass of juice had a protein shake, which down actually went down okay. But I was like, I, the thought of putting actual chunks of food in my mouth made yeah. me like want to throw up. So it wasn't happening. <laughs> then I drank my intra workout, and then I just buzzed up like this. It's an actually ridiculous amount of powder. It was three hundred and thirty grams was two scoops of this mass gainer. Um, 1,250 calories, something along those lines. And I, people I, complaining that they can't get in their calories. I, I couldn't finish it. Like, I was like, I'm going to be, like, I'd actually be sick if I had... Yeah, but, uh, I mean, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. In, in regards to this, it's just like, you're eating 2,800 calories. You shouldn't complain about not getting in enough calories. Because, I mean, one shake of that actually fills you out or nearly or, or over one third of your calorie intake for the day right it's not crazy. in your case but in my example it's absolutely crazy even like it's a lot of powder but it's mostly i think like maltodextrin and some like whey protein yeah. once it's all blended down you could blend it down with like 500, 500 mils of water if you wanted to it'd be quite thick but it's like it filled up half of my like yeah. uh, blender and it was like 330 grams. Normally I use like 30 grams from, of yeah. whey protein. So it was just, it's nuts, but it's hopefully going to be a lifesaver so long as my appetite seems to pick up in the evening, which is kind of completely counter to what I really expect and want mm. from a like chrono nutrition standpoint. I know it's very early days in terms of how much impact that has but i don't really like stuffing myself before bed so i kind of just seek my windows of opportunity when i'm like weird i can eat and i just eat oh. um but yeah hopefully the the illness won't be anything much and it'll just pass by um and i can just like yeah it, it's weird the only time the, the worst you're right it's the worst i felt and it's similar feeling to this but it was actually worse than this was when i was um depleting in contest prep for a peak week 
And that's when <laughs> I literally, I remember it. I, I don't know if you remember me saying it. I don't know how much I communicated I to you. Yeah. yeah. I just would do client check-ins, train, and then crash <laughs> the yeah. rest of the day. I'd yeah. sleep literally the whole day. <laughs> I think it was, though, a very valuable lesson for you, especially you've written about Peak Weeks, you presented on Peak Week, and having have gone through it yourself, the kind of torture, unnecessary torture for a natural athlete, right? I mean... Yeah, it's, it's also hard to know, like, are you just being a pussy? Like, I, I find it really, it frustrates me because I'm like, most of the time I have no sympathy for people who are saying like, oh, oh, they have a cold, oh, poor you, or like, oh, you can't eat enough calories, oh, poor you, or like, oh, you depleted for peak week, I bet you felt like yeah. crap, but it's like, you don't truly know how that person is feeling unless you're them. So to like judge, it's very hard to actually truly judge. I, I can say like, I don't know. It's tr if I tried to eat, I would vomit. If I try, if I had a normal job when I was trying to deplete for peak week, I couldn't have held it down. Like they would have been yeah. like, "What the fuck, this guy?" Hey, yeah, absolutely. And you bring something up that is holds true, right? In the sense of everyone perceives their level of suffering and what they are able to endure differently, right? Some people who have gone through hell may be able and capable of withstanding more physical or uh, psychological demands whereas other people who have never gone through anything like this it may already be quite demanding just like a, a normal stress of everyday life right and who are you then to judge whose stressor is more severe right everyone perceives it differently because everyone has different experiences and has grown up differently and thus i think that everyone should be looked at individually as well yeah, um, actually, uh, yeah. So i was just going to say from a, a contest prep point of view and this is why we like getting clients early because you actually get an understanding of which clients you know when they're complaining they're just being a pussy or like <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a good term pussy it's kind uh, of 20 we're coming into 2020 maybe i should just say they're being weak or whatever um <laughs> and what am i going to say yeah and then others who when they're saying they feel like crap you're like oh my gosh this guy is actually like gonna pass out and die or yeah. something because he is a, like a true warrior um but you don't know I mean, that cliff cliff talked about it in the latest yeah. um podcast episode as well where he said like he has some people where you j just know that you have to actually i don't know put the gas off the gas uh, put, put the foot off the gas pedal because they are just pushing too hard and other people you really have to actually step down on the gas pedal because they are not pushing hard enough but they perceive as if they are pushing hard and the more times i've taken people through to contest prep the more i've understood like who who and when i should push and when i shouldn't and pull back and things like this yeah and also in my opinion at least um you become a little bit more objective and not too emotional in the sense of empathetic yeah um i think that empathy is a very important skill to have but the thing is that sometimes you just have to say be like upfront with them and say like okay we have to push otherwise you won't make it or you won't look as crisp as you would like to and if that's something that you're cool with then all right then let's let's um, push a little bit harder right but if you really want to make it and want to be the very best as you told me you want to be then we have to just push now right yeah. and i was hesitant in the past of just being upfront with people of in that situation where it was just like ah, they are already on very low calories. They are already doing so much cardio. I can't really pu pull back more on the on the um, calories now because that would break them, right? But sometimes it's just what you have to do. And sometimes, and I think honesty is the best policy, policy there as well. And sometimes it, in those situations, it's hard to make the call as well, whether or not pushing them because sometimes pushing them isn't the right answer and actually pulling back is the right answer. It's kind of like, but are they holding on to like, are they just really like stress and holding on to loads of water and we're kind of like pushing would put them further into that hole? Oh. And do we need to like give them some, a couple of days refeeding? But then are we sacrificing a couple of days of refeeding uh, where we could be losing fat? And it's kind of like, this is where I think yeah. only experience as a coach can come in and you can make those calls better every time because you don't always know it's kind of um like that book i was reading it's like 
everything in life like decisions you make is like a ratio of right and wrong just you might have been more right or more wrong a certain time and you can't always know until you've done the the action yeah yeah, absolutely and this is um back in the i think 50s or 60s some economists actually said like you can only be more knowledgeable in hindsight after you've done something Oh, I don't, this is based on like financial investments, financial decisions. You will only know whether it was the right choice after you've done that choice. Right? Um, yeah, and that holds true in every kind of situation in life. Right? And then in those situations, I found it really nice to be honest with clients and just be like, we, we, I can't, because I think a lot of the time coaches put pressure on themselves saying, oh, they have to be right. They have to make all the right calls and blah, blah, blah. And you can't be. And it's just no. kind of having that understanding with your client that, yeah, I can fuck up just like you can fuck up, unfortunately. It's just so hard sometimes because um, this is something that we brought up in the last episode as well, that um, the the relationship between a coach and a client, sometimes the, cl- the, the clients expect too much of you. Um, I can see why that is the case because they are putting a lot of trust in you but of course you can't do the job for them and as you rightly pointed out so yourself we are just humans of course we make mistakes by the mistakes we get better unfortunately some will be hit by those mistakes but it's a necessary evil yeah absolutely um so in terms of your week, how's your week been going? You're not ill, you're well. The first week of your hypertrophy. Yeah, but just back to normal and nothing great. I mean, yeah, back to the hypertrophy block and pumps are there, soreness is there. I just, it's so, it's so crazy because a couple of years back, I never liked to train into the hypertrophy rep range. And now it's just like, I can't even imagine anything else anymore. I, I'm I'm very bored by low repetition stuff quite quickly. I don't like it to be, I don't know, have that, what is it, systemic fatigue from heavy squatting, heavy, heavy deadlifting, where you feel like as if you're getting ill as well. Don't like that feeling anymore. I, I like the sensation that you get in your, in your muscles uh, the days to true follow. Um, yeah, t- absolutely a true bro. Um, yeah, but back to normal. So nothing really on my end to report. Um, just taking off the boxes, basically. What what I realized, though, that this is something I brought um, that I realized for myself, is when it comes to exercise selection, I'm someone who really doesn't like to change too, uh, things too, uh, things up too drastically when it comes to my setup and programming. It's just too unpredictable for me um, in the sense like, okay, yes, when you're going to introduce a new exercise in, uh, in, in, in exchange for a bicep curl, doing a bicep curl with dumbbell is probably nearly the same as with a barbell, right? Not really that much of a difference. Um, but when it comes to those heavy compound lifts, those fundamental basic um, exercises, which I know work for me, I like to keep them in, right? Because I know what they give me and I don't have to actually change my exercises up too frequently just for the sake of changing things up. I'm not going to the gym out of motivational purposes or out of willpower or something like that. It is just a habit of mine. And thus, I don't need that variation for motivational purposes or to stay on track. And that makes things so much easier and um, so much more predictable when it comes to the overall progression. And it makes it so much easier also to analyze whether you've actually progressed or not. Um, just something I realized for myself here, especially this week, I think I always knew that, but it just became very clear to me this time around that when I set up that new mesocycle, I was like, okay, what exercise should I pick? Okay, I I will mostly pick those exercises that that I've done in the last macro cycle. And yeah. I held on to, I I went through a few phases with it. Um, I went for a long time not changing any exercises like very rarely ever if ever and then i went through a phase even actually i think it was in my um prep where i would change them literally every mesocycle we changed them um and i think that was 
I, I don't know if um, Mike and Jared have changed. I, I think they have changed their views. I think they were very um, of the opinion that changing them med cycle to med cycle was a, a, a fine, if not good thing to do. Um, Cause I was working with Jared kind of consulting at that time. Um, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we were kind of under the assumption changing them every med cycle was like a cool thing to do. He, and I believe he's, he may have changed his opinion. I know Mike is, likes having them for a longer period of time now he certainly changed his opinion on that which is is cool um, and i have as well since like but the main thing was trackability um, and i like now keeping them in for at least like a macro cycle and then i tend to swap some out in a macro cycle but like this one i can't remember what lifts i've kept in a few um, or i've changed them very very little like assisted pull-ups i did today i've just changed the yeah. grip it's not really changed uh -huh. totally and like hack squats i was introducing and i was like i kind of just wanted to introduce just normal hack squats but I was like, i've never done normal hack squats <laughs> i have no idea where to begin really so i was like i'm just going to do banded hack squats because i did those like six months ago and i have some loads to base off um so yeah over time i guess you collect all this data and then you can rotate a bit more comfortably knowing whereabouts you should be because sometimes it can be a bit like huh, never done this yeah. movement before where do I begin? I mean, for me, I think the exercise variation comes automatically in that I'm incorporating a metabolite block and a primer phase. And then these uh, mesocycles, I automatically change those variations or exercise. And also the, there's a variation in the rep ranges in it for itself, with, which probably gives you a different kind of stimulus as well, at least a little bit. And thus... When I then rotate back, it is kind of as if you haven't done those exercises for a very long time because, yeah, to be honest, you, you haven't. There have been two other mesocycles in between. Yeah, the metabolite block is quite similar to what you've been doing before, but because of a slight variation in some of the exercises, which just are more suited towards a metabolite buildup, and then the primer phase, which in nature is quite different, um, I think that is enough variation in my opinion. And when you then fancy changing things up here and there, that is totally all right. What I've done is, for example, instead of doing a single leg leg press this time around, I'm doing a Smith machine squat. But <laughs> just to keep things in perspective here, uh, this is one of the what, uh, one of the few exercises I've changed. I think in total, I may have changed like two, three exercises or so, uh, I would need to look into my program right now and compare it to the last uh, macro cycle. But there isn't a lot of variation there. And the variation can also come from something like you've mentioned, just varying the exercise in it for itself. Yeah. Right now I'm doing the RDLs with a little bit of a wider stance. Yeah. Just because right now I can feel that it gives me or provides me a better connection with those muscles whereas before it was always a little bit more narrow which is funny but sometimes it's just how i i go with those exercises as well how they feel in a specific mesocycle or so yeah i guess that i mean that's the same with like you can change stance on a squat rdl why not um grip on bench pressing things like this and yeah. you can just end up slightly hitting an area that maybe is feeling a bit more like sensitized i guess could be the term it's just feeling, it feels a bit fresher and feels a bit better that way so yeah. i like that in terms of your nutrition i'm interested we haven't spoken about it you still just because i think the listeners think maybe both of us are dieting yeah but now they don't because they heard that i wasn't because yeah, I, I changed my plans yeah you as well. neither do i because um after steve came up with this new strategy i was actually thinking my strategy as well because i'm lighter than you at the moment um you're close to 200 pounds right yeah and i weight myself so what is it in pounds um i'm 86 kilograms right now what is it in pounds one one eight 188 or something like that okay. could it be something like that right 190 is 90 kilograms i think it is uh, anyway but i was rethinking my strategy as well and we've been joking so off off air we've been joking around with saying okay if i'm starting to cut now and then i'm planning on cutting until december taking then a break a short break and then start my contest prep and my first show will be in august then i would be contest prepping or dieting for like 11 or t near, uh, close to 12 months which is when all jokes aside not really the best strategy in my opinion um so because of that i was just then also 
rethinking my strategy and rethinking my approach and i came to the conclusion that it's maybe also a good idea to still push it a little bit until the end of the year which then still gives me like eight to nine months of prepping so and if that's not enough then you've been too fat to even consider a contest prep and in there, oh. do you have built-in maintenance periods or like extended maintenance periods or like primer phases or do you just have diet breaks built in? Yeah, before that, um, I had like a four-week primer phase planned into the contest prep. I don't know. So I think I will still plan it in, but whether it will end up being a four-week primer phase or maybe just like a two-week block of maintenance or so will of course depend on the rate of weight loss how the first part of the contest prep is going but right now i'm in a good position um i'm I'm not overly fat or anything like that um i'm looking the best i've ever looked at that body weight which is quite pleasing to me um and yeah i think that i'm in a good spot to actually stick around here for a little bit longer before then the actual prep starts right and yeah it it all it all started when you brought up your strategy because it just made me reevaluate my situation and just realize how to be honest idiotic my approach would be if i if i actually go down that road i mean you could buy yourself some time and you could make things a little bit easier while on prep but if you're ready too early, that's not a good thing as well. Yeah, being ready early is good, right? But being ready too early is not a good thing because then you have to stick around at that low body fat percentage. And because it's not the healthiest place to be, the longer you are in that state, the harder it is. And the 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 worse, I would assume, you look after a while. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, what was I going to say? Well, b- by the way, uh, I think Valentin Tambosi actually in his last season had that exact he thing did. where he stayed in that shape for six months or so. And he said like at the end, he just didn't look the way yeah. he did at the beginning. I was going to say, I just multiply. Did you say you're 86 kilos? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just, you're about 10 pounds lighter than me basically when yeah. I'm full of food <laughs> as I am now. Like I suddenly <laughs> yeah. went to uh, just 198 pounds. Yeah. So see, I mean, it's not, it's not, I'm, if I was or were to look like shit right now, then holy shit. I mean, then I'm doing something wrong, I would say. Right. Awesome. Um, what was I going to say? I The analogy I really liked, I think I heard it from Mike, was like when you're that lean and like you try and maintain it for a long period of time it's like you're on fire and like sure you can have refeeds you can have like week offs this is like people throwing a bit of water on you but you're still on fire <laughs> like yeah. so you're still slowly burning you're still slowly yeah. picking up fatigue um whilst you're there and yeah this is i've seen people do it where they get ready potentially too early and we think it's something we can hold but you're adding fatigue and you often see that they're physique just looks a bit more watery a bit more dull less pops so there definitely yeah. is a timing thing with it um you have to be actually quite strategic with it um or do as like jeff alberts would say kind of don't pick a show and just go when your physique is ready again that's kind of then you don't need to be as strategic because you've kind of got that auto regulated in yeah but unfortunately here in europe we so don't so. have the luxury that there are shows all year round that's the unfortunate thing in the us i think that's it's a little bit of a different kind of approach where you're just like i don't know in the next month or so or next two months there will be a show somewhere and you can pick that one right um yeah for us the season most of the time at least uh, across europe is most of the time like around june up to november time so and everything before that nothing's really there most of the time at yeah, least not the federations are i'm aspiring to compete in yeah there's a little bit around april and then yeah pit, like finals are now so yeah. pretty much now so I, I think the early shows are more like novice shows isn't it i, I know that I for the uk dfba it's the amateur show in may for example that kicks off kind of the season and then the normal regular regional start and um yeah yeah the funny thing is if you were to qualify for finals at those early shows, what, uh, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what yeah. unless you like were just very lucky and you were quite over yeah. fat and you've got plenty more fat to lose and you somehow qualified, where'd you yeah. go from there? So 
Yeah, it's uh, I think if for first time, like for you, I expect August, you're going to look to bring your best look. Um, no. You're not necessarily, like I didn't plan that I'd qualify for finals. That was just a bonus. No. And then at that point, you can decide, you can reverse into finals if you wanted to or whatever you decide. Yeah. And also what I'm planning on doing is actually take that at the, as the first show, maybe do another regionals over in UK, maybe also then compete at the BMBF or so. So I'm, I'm looking to actually compete at the UK DFBA and then BMBF, take some shows with me there. And then the first show in uh, shows in Germany start as well. So actually compete Ooh. there and then end the season, right? Have like three, four, maybe five shows. I'm not planning or I'm not, I, I don't expect that I will qualify for finals because in the UK, the competition is just too insane. And Germany is actually very good as well. You just don't hear that much about that. Um, so I don't expect to qualify for finals. And if I do, yeah, cool, right? But I don't expect it to be that way. But I can still plan in that to do a decent amount of shows to get the most out of that competition season as possible. Yeah, I think it's, I definitely want to do like at least, a, like at least one qualifier for the BMBF and the UK DFBA. And if I qualify in both immediately, like awesome. But if I don't, then I yeah. like, there's, it's just more experience. Um, yeah. That's a big reason both of us are doing it because we enjoy it. And for experience, for coaching kind of our competitors, because get your wet feet now and then you kind of pick up something new, you kind of get new respect for and you remember how dark some of those days can be <laughs> so looking uh, forward to that <laughs> yeah um shall we go into the, the yeah. questions um so this time around dan um is there any type of interference that occurs when you train different rep ranges in the same workout for the same muscle groups for example doing sets of an of eight on a heavy compound movement like a squat followed by a set of 10 to 20 plus on isolation movements like leg extensions would there be potential benefit to separating the stars of training into different days of the week thanks cool question um so i don't think we know from a scientific standpoint whether or not there's uh, interference between the two um i also think if you're doing sufficient volume through the week and you're progressively overloading you're going to be growing um so i don't think it's enough if there is interference to stop growth then the question is is it better to maybe separate lower and higher repetition work and i think um that's where kind of daily undulating periodization came in um where it's really good for kind of fatigue management where you kind of hit one type of fibers of the muscles and then they get a bit of rest you hit another area and that kind of undulating pattern seems to work really favorably for like um, overload and adaptation and um, recovery so i think i heard mike a while ago talk about this i'm not sure if it was on the podcast or on rp plus he talked about it somewhere where he was kind of like i think keeping kind of five up to 20 and then 10 to 30 kind of like that and not doing like fives up to 30 um, is a good idea and I think that makes sense because uh, it kind of keeps that undulating periodization um, through the week or like programming really um, and keeps you utilizing that and getting the benefits that that's got and there's loads of research supporting utilizing DUP and most good periodized programs use that so I think that's where my perspective comes in. I totally agree on that one. And also what I like to do, um, and Dan, I don't know if that's my Dan, so my client, I don't know, could very well be, I have no idea, um, but he listens to our podcast. So um, what I like doing is having a wide range of rep ranges in one workout. So for example, working all the way from six to 12 or 15 repetitions, it's not that wide, but it is just for the purpose of accumulating a little bit more volume. And also, um, it is appropriate for the exercise selection. So what I mean by that is when you're starting off with a heavy compound, doing something like 15 repetitions on a squat is just absolutely nasty. And then you are so fatigued that you can't accumulate a more volume with other exercises. So working in a rep range of six to eight, totally fine right then you move over to the next exercise which is um, i brought up the example of now uh, the squat but let's just say you did a bench press first six to eight repetitions then you move over to somewhat of a secondary accessory lift let's say a vertical press such as dumbbell incline presses right with the six to eight repetitions with dumbbell incline presses 
in my opinion, it's not the, the most feasible and most appropriate way of doing things. The risk is of getting injured, uh, the stability portion of the lift is just too hard, right? And also getting a good mind-muscle connection and control over the exercise. With something like this, I like to work in the repetition range like 10 to 12 repetitions. But that is due to its being a free weight, also quite fatiguing. And you're already uh, a little bit pre-fatigued from the heavy compound lift. Then, if that's not enough volume, I like to incorporate another exercise that is then in the 12 to 15 repetition range, which is more like a machine isolation movement, such as like a pack deck, just to accumulate a little bit more of a stimulus in the higher repetition range. That is not really that much of a higher repetition range, but uh, it is ranging from 6 to 15 repetitions. And I think that when you're working in that repetition range for most of the time, I think you're golden. And I totally agree with you and also then with Mike. Having things such as 6 to 8 repetitions and something like, I don't know, 25 to 30 repetitions in one workout doesn't really make that much sense to me. I then like it more like this that... Let's just say you have a push pull legs, push pull legs in the in the week. That the first half of the week is a little bit more in the lower to moderate rep range, and the end of the week is more in the moderate to high repetition range. And th this is how you could set it up, for example. Sweet, yeah, with that. Cool. Then let's move over to Padrem. So someone recently sent me a message over on Instagram and saying like, "Okay, when you get to my questions, say hi." Um. But I can't really record his name yeah, right now. Just say hi to everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I need to say hi. Um, so, hey, Steve, and hey, German guy. Haha, <laughs> hey, Pascal. I like high carb, low, low, low fat diet in bulk and in cut season. No difference. In, in fact, I'm on 15, below 15 to 20 grams of fats per day from about two to three years with no problems at all. We know the minimum fats requirements we need is really, really low in truth, about 1 to 3 of omega-3 to 6 per day, uh, which are the only essential fatty acids. In fact, we can produce the other fats we need from carbs and proteins. However, I want to ask you if, from a purely aesthetic view, there is any benefit in acute to have a far fats refeeding on the body aspect. Thank you, Steve and Pascal. So sorry for yeah, me just stuttering all the time. Um, but it was, it was a little bit oh, weirdly written. But I think that you got the question. Just, yeah. So yeah. essentially, is there anything that fats are providing the body above which minimal needs can benefit us? Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of any, um, apart from kind of the essential fatty acids, obviously, that he mentioned, and then the, the fat-soluble vitamins. That would be something I'd be sure to be aware of. Um, it would concern me being that low for that long. Just inherently, it seems a little bit extreme, and generally, I'm not a favor of, like, very extreme uh, approaches. But if he feels well, if he's had, like, blood markers done and they all look good and he feels in good health, then I can't really argue against it. Um, I don't have any reason to believe that fats any, anywhere really gonna and unless you're gonna mention something that i'm gonna be like oh yeah maybe uh, but i can't think of anything off the top of my head that fats gonna do apart from obviously like adherence preferences enjoyment of the diet which could play into things so when it comes to the minimum fat intake i think that is first and foremost highly individual um so what you need for a day to day on a day-to-day -day basis may vary very drastically from someone else um, however, when it comes to that minimum fat intake, while yes, we only basically need the essential fatty acids, I don't think, and this is where I could be completely wrong, um, I don't think that you will get the fats um, for these processes from a uh, from from other nutrients such as carbohydrates and protein even though that there is something like de novo lipogenesis right um i don't think that this even though that it's how should i put it maybe maybe i'm now confusing myself but what's what's essential is actually dietary fat into our diets because 
from our fat stores, we can't actually uh, provide us with the essential fatty acids that we need to have for the production of, for example, cell membranes. They are out of lipids, right? Essential for that. Uh, cholesterol synthesis as well. So everything is then based, uh, so all the sex hormones are based of a cho cholesterol. Um, something like that needs dietary fats. So I'm not entirely certain whether carbohydrates going through something like uh, de novo lipogenesis um, or a, a different process or something like that is then giving you the dietary fat. I, I, I would assume that this is only a process for that energy to be stored, right? And the stored fat resources aren't there for then being used for the uh, production of certain processes in the body, if that makes sense. Um, am I just rambling, Steve, or does it actually make sense? I imagine at least, um, like people say, oh, you don't need carbohydrates aren't essential. We can get that from like ketosis and um, what's it called? Gluconeogenesis. And at least if it's similar to that, I imagine at least it's inefficient and inefficiencies generally aren't yeah. more optimal. But I think that the, um, the turnover from proteins and also from carbohydrates going through these processes um, to then actually create fats. This is only a process for stored energy because you can't make use of those substrates. For example, protein, when it then um, is being created into fats, which is hardly ever the case um, because it's just a, such a complex and coast-worthy process for the body, but let's just assume that it happens with carbohydrates, um, then... I think it is only for storages of those dietary fats and not for the processes that the body is requiring for other processes in the body to then, for example, create cell membranes and stuff. So essential things. I think that needs to come from dietary fats that you consume like, so the triglycerides that you are consuming. But once again, I could be so completely wrong with that. It would be amazing if there's a biochemist here actually writing it down in the comment section and enlighten me and giving me also a little bit more knowledge whether um, going through something like de novo lipogenesis um, from these other substrates is actually then just going towards the storage of fat or that the fat or the fatty acids are then even used for other processes in the body. Because if that's the case, then yes, I would assume that that that, that you don't even need fats to con consume fats, right? Except for those essential fatty acids from, coming from, for example, omega-3 and omega-6s. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a very, very good question, which just sparks so many ideas and thoughts in, into my mind, which I don't have the answers to, to be very honest. Cool. Yeah, the only other thing I was thinking of was, um, I know Menno's done, and I don't know if I completely know exactly what Menno was talking about here, but there's something to be said for like some saturated fat within your diet for testosterone production, and then potentially like cholesterol having an, like an impact there. So I'm just not sure there's any real benefit to going as extreme as that low fat um, and whether or not we might not know but I just there's definitely no extra benefit to going that low so why not just in case there are some benefits of being a bit higher to just be a bit higher that, that's actually a good point um, because right now it's just I have not the answer to it um, I would assume that we so we all know that there is a minimum fat intake requirement um, or not we all know that, but we all assume that because this is what we've heard. But to give you a clear answer why, um, I just know a couple of processes that are essential for the body where or where dietary fats are essential for the production of certain things. But I couldn't tell you how much of dietary fat that actually is and refers to to make those processes actually happen. Yeah, yeah I think very interesting. Yeah. Though. And thank you very much for that uh, question because I, I'm now very curious about the answer as well. So, yeah. Man, I get all the long questions here today. What is wrong? Full as muffins. 
So be prepared, mate. Hey guys, I've been following Mike's style of progression and periodization for one year, but I always stick to no more than six weeks mesocycles and average MRV according to Mike, thinking that the chance that I'm certainly average, but I never experienced true overreaching. With the recent high volume studies, I try to push volume higher and I've done one eight to nine weeks mesocycle with 30 sets on some body parts in the final week and even know I experienced some overreaching signs. I've only seen drop in performance for one movement in the final week. I'm deloading now because it seems crazy to run accumulation weeks for that long, but I will try to find my MRV in the next mesos. My question is, have you ever had experiences of this type with some of your intermediate clients, or do you think it's a sign that a person is still a beginner or not training hard enough? Thanks, bros. Interesting. Um... So I agree with him that he moved away from just assuming he was average because I don't think that's ever necessarily a good thing to just assume. Start there maybe, um, but then like he has, auto-regulated. Um, and it sounds like he listens to like Mike and understands how that's meant to look. So I'd assume that, I mean, that's fine what he did there. And um, I've had clients who, if they can go for that long, they are normally either more novice and or new to this style of training um, and generally i find it difficult to go much more than like five or six weeks just because of uh, the cap of like reps in reserve um, a lot of the time in that if you start at three to four if each week they come down by one you kind of have a limit of like five weeks or so um, so to go for like nine weeks then you might be re repeating performance in some weeks um, or maybe you are more novice and intermediate and you're able to adapt week to week sometimes or maybe you did under train at the beginning of the mesocycle a good test to know if you under trained at the beginning of the mesocycle i always find is in that final weeks when you were going to one slash naught reps in reserve look at that performance versus week one if there was a big difference in performance then you probably were under training uh, or not going hard enough in the first week but if there was like what four reps difference or like 10 kilos or something then you probably were spot on and you're doing exactly what you should be doing and maybe you're one of those outliers and they're not average and you can respond well to higher volumes um yeah that's kind of at least my take on it yeah i have so many thoughts on that one because um it is such a broad question, actually, when you really think about it, because for really answering that, why that possibly could be the case, we have to assume many things. So we have to assume that um, when you are following someone like Mike, for example, and listening to our podcast, now we are assuming that you have your training frequency in check, you have your exercise selection in check, you have the rep ranges, the relative in intensity in check, and these are all just assumptions. So it could very well be that you're only training with machines, for example, that have a very, very low uh, systemic fatigue compartment to them. Could very well be, right? So a lot of assumptions here, but... My take on the matter, and this is something I just looked up because I have done a post in 2018 on that one. And uh, I'm just going to read it out loud and then I will um, address some of the points. So what's the likelihood that your work capacity is extraordinarily high? Say a max recoverable volume of 30 plus sets per body part. Actually, the likelihood is pretty low. What's more likely is that you are one, not doing quality reps. Two, not training without uh, training without intent and just moving the weight. Three, not training as hard as you think. Four, simply not strong. Five, doing too much is isolation work. Six, doing too much junk volume. Seven, too distracted during the training. Eight, not having a proper program. Nine, you are on gear. And ten, you are a female. And quite possibly a combination of the above. So in that regard, if you can say or tick off those boxes, right, and you can 100% say that these are not were, uh, applying to you, then very well. It could very well be that you are someone who needs to push it up to that level. However, take a look at these kind of uh, things that are brought up there very honestly. So can you say for certain that your execution is 
absolutely on point. Can you say for certain that your relative intensity, so the RERs you set for yourself, are truly hit and truly met? Are you resting long enough to actually also keep that intensity up there? Because it could very well be, or that you are resting too long as well, right? Where, where then just ends up in like junk volume at some point where you're just doing that, but you're not causing acute fatigue because you're resting for so long. So there, there's a lot of things that can play into that. But in the grand scheme of things, sure, it could very well be that you need to push it up there. But more than or more than often i'm very skeptical when someone needs to do more that, than 20 to more than 30 sets even right sometimes with something like delts bicep pushing it up to 25 sets is, is easily done and easily achieved so um but everything beyond that especially on those bigger muscle groups i'm becoming very skeptical and i would then just be honest with yourself look at those kind of things and see whether you are kind of cheating yourself at some point and if not hey very much welcome to just push it up there yeah cool so sorry for the no that was good um, it was really good i think a lot of people Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe it wasn't fully applicable to fillers muffins but i definitely think there'd be some listeners that would have taken a lot from that cool so oh yeah so the annoyed listener oh what comes now oh, what no. comes now i i don't even know if that's another question we don't want to read out loud uh <laughs> yeah it is oh you do want to so, read it good <laughs> yeah no no uh, i mean i can read it out loud okay so Ditch the kitty rape jokes next time, guys. It's not funny and great way to lose listeners. Well, that was what a long time ago you made that joke, wasn't it? I can't even yeah. remember. It was something I was completely ignorant to. Yeah. I mean, I could I could give my comments to that, but he's not even listening anymore You're dark because humor. he's an annoyed listener. And uh, yeah, I think we lost him with that. But that is absolutely all right because that's just my sense of humor. Next. It is, it is the same as uh, when, um, people. So you you just brought it up in the beginning, right? It's twenty or close to twenty twenty, and everyone is just offended by everything that has been said, right? So you can't actually not you cannot offend someone it's, because it's no hard. matter what what side you're picking, um, un- subcon- or unconsciously, right? You are always offending someone with your with what you're saying, right? So, um, yeah, that's just t- 2019 right now, coming up to 2020. That's the world we're living in. And this is the luxury of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when we have the luxury of very much um, being concerned about these kind of things. True. So it is actually a good thing. Um, oh, he actually uh, submitted it twice. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um so benjamin turgeon what do you think of shrugs as a trap movement i never really feel it in my upper traps even with good form and with jeff nippert's recent with you with mano hanselman's in which he mano says shrugs don't really activate the traps because of the angle of the muscle fibers i'm wondering if i should just remove this movement from my training thanks Cool. So I think he answered the question for him. He does shrugs with good form and gets nothing from it. If you're getting nothing from a movement, even if it's meant to be a gold standard movement for that muscle group, like you've you've done everything you could have, you've tried it. Um, hopefully you've had someone look over your form um, and you've really given it a good go. I'd say sack it off. Um, that's as, as, as far as I take it. In terms of shrugs and kind of Menno's comments there, I don't know. I see people comment about things and they say stuff and I'm kind of like, yeah, but doing it this way works really well for me and so and it works really well for a lot of people like shrugs and I've done shrugs and I get a huge pump in my traps and I find they're really good like trap movement for me so um, I always just take those sort of comments with a pinch of salt and remember like n equals one you are your own case study so even though shrugs may work for me like you they don't work for you so maybe you have to try something else what I would say is um, there's quite a lot of different variants of shrug. So you can do like cable, you can do dumbbell, you can do leaning, you can do smith, you can do barbell. Try a variety and just see if one of them kind of gets you in that position where you're like, oh, now I feel it. Um, but again, like isolating your traps, 
how much of a big deal is that if you're doing like some deadlifting, you're doing rowing, ugh, not a big deal. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm not doing trap work, direct trap work. Um, with what I felt is giving me much more a connection with my traps is actually something like upright rows, for example, or even uh, face pulls with a certain variation and a, f- a certain way to pull. So I'm not doing direct, like, well, directly shrugs because it's same as you. I've never actually felt them the way I wanted them to. And I did them in many, many ways. I did them um very meticulously trying to make them work for me never worked did them with dumbbells did them with a barbell did them on their deadlift machine never worked for me so i moved away from it and actually tried to do something else with that and maybe it just is because i'm using complete anecdote here my traps are quite big and maybe it's just like i connect with them easily and like yeah. uh, not say i don't know like your traps aren't small or anything but mine are like <laughs> they're abnormally one of my big body parts so uh-huh. i probably just connect well with a lot of movements and even like lateral raises I've, i think i've even said it to you before i'm like i just got a lap pump uh, uh sorry a trap pump and less of a delt pump <laughs> it's kind of like god damn uh-huh. it <laughs> so yeah moving over to the next uh, very long question <laughs> so uh this comes from i'm james brickman but wait a second hello there my name is jacob Okay, I'm 31 years old, novice, and as I learn more and more every day, I found your materials to be such an awesome tool to better myself. Thank you very much. Therefore, I would love to hear, read your thoughts on what I'm currently doing, and hopefully my question would be interesting topic for your podcast. To the point, I'm training every other day, so one day training, one day rest. Two times days when I train in a in a row, it's five times five with heavier weights then two times five by ten for kind of volume training i've all i'm already lost um already now steve um should i continue (laughs) continue i I think he's so he said he trains every other day but then also mentioned that he trains back to back that was a bit confusing um well so wait a second um so just like strong Basically, just like strong lifts. Um, can I switch rep ranges so often? And is it optimal for muscle growth or should I stick to one rep range uh, for longer, like two weeks mm. plus one month cool. before changing it? How does it affect my muscles? Regards from Poland. Cool. Thank you very much, Jacob or James. We're not sure. <laughs> I'm going to say you're Jacob and yeah. you uh, got, got confused during your submission. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we talked about it before, didn't we? Um, undulating repetition ranges through yeah. the week. Sounds like you have a heavy day and you have a lighter day. And what you could also do is you could even make those more extreme. You could incorporate some lighter movements in that heavier day. So it's like not just fives, it's maybe five to like 10. And then you could make the lighter day like, I don't know, 15 to 25 or something. Like uh, we know we can grow well from at least in the short term, all the way from 30% of your one rep max to 100%. Now, we don't recommend going above like 85% of your one rep max most of the time, which is like five rep max because the stimulus is high, but the fatigue is really high. Um, so yeah, I think go with it. Um, it sounds good. And if you listen to us talk through the other question, which hopefully you did, Jacob, um, you would have got a lot from that. And that would have probably confirmed that what you're doing right now is pretty much ticking good boxes. Yeah. I think, um, like, over the past month or two months, right, I am so in doubt about what the best approach to training actually is. So we just recently had um, Alex Boyven on the podcast, which comes out here, on, uh, which came out on Saturday. And his, his thoughts and what he said made me rethink a lot of my approaches as well um, when it comes to, for example, uh, incorporating intensity as well. And the, it simply must be said, yes, we are making fun of the bros, right? But um, no, actually, we're yeah, every once in a while we're making fun of the bros. But they go fucking in there and they crush it. They work their ass off, right? And very many people who are on the IFBB stage maybe pros but they do look very good yes you can blame the genetics yes you can blame the drugs but still there's something to it right um 
it is a question that is up for debate whether then volume or if they are training in a different style would actually yield them with better progress. But at the same time, you have to just acknowledge that the way they train with um, actually high intensity as well gives them something at least, right? And then um, having that in mind, this needs someone like Alex, you just every once in a while rethink your own approach to training and whether pushing sometimes the intensity up or how to distribute and how to balance the intensity to volume ratio is actually the best one. And it's still so much up for debate and it's so crazy, right? Because sometimes you go through these cyclical phases where you're in doubt about your own methodologies, about your own progress, about what is right, what is wrong. Um, and sometimes you are very much convinced about that this is the right and good thing, right? And um, I don't know, I just wanted to bring that up because now I'm seeing that he trains in the in a lower repetition range. Um, and what I think, because he's more of a novice and beginner, and I think, yeah, getting stronger is probably a good idea for someone like you, Jacob. And then um, worrying about volume may be a good way after, after all in a, for, for longevity purposes. But at the same time, just focusing on getting stronger has not, at least for me, and this is where I'm biased, not led to a lot of size. Because when I was able to deadlift triple body weight, I was not, not muscular, uh, muscular at all, at all. Same goal for squat. When I was able to actually squat close to 100, uh, 200 kilograms, I wasn't big. I didn't have massive quads and stuff like that. So strength in it for itself just pushing for strength at least for me makes me biased uh, that this isn't the way to get a lot or gain a lot out of that but yeah it's it's just just wanted to bring that up no i i agree um i've had similar i've been, i've triple body weighted my deadlift yeah <laughs> um and i've squat like i think i squat over 200 200 kilos once but and I couldn't do that now. Like, I don't think I could just go and pick it up because strength no, is a skill. Could I. Like, yeah. it's a complete skill and my form's different. I care now and I take care of tempo and control and some my muscle connection. And so I'm way bigger than I was back then, back then, but I was somewhat stronger, at least pound per pound, definitely way stronger. But that isn't what caused hypertrophy for me. And um, at least Alex talked about that where he was like a lot of people end up chasing to get like PRs every week and they chase to get mm. stronger it's kind of like the way I now frame it is more so like let progression come to you and that was very much thanked to like Brian Minor where he was like more so the progressive overload you get is a consequence of your training not like oh. you have to get that to progress it's kind of like chicken and egg type of scenario um, but that helped me because I think a lot of people or at least for a long time people are about like oh yeah if like take what's there and like really push and try and hit a PR every week and past the novice stage, it becomes really unrealistic. Um, yeah. And I've now just been more about like putting the work in and take what comes to me um, over time. And I then eventually hit numbers I never imagined I'd hit. And I kind of like, oh, that came out of nowhere. Yeah, it's funny because um, I just recently thought about my own progress and the weights haven't gone up like, extremely much over like the time frame of like two years let's say but the thing is because so many people uh, expect that to put more load on the bar on a week to week or mesocycle to mesocycle basis now imagine just sit down and really think about it we all can fathom and imagine that putting load on the bar week to week is probably not going to happen because even if you micro load like week to week that would be 52 kilograms micro loading on an entire um in an entire year that is not even reasonable right so everyone can imagine that but even micro loading on a mesocycle to mesocycle basis is even not feasible right when you really think about that that would mean that doing on the lat pull downs i would now do lat pull downs with six years of experience like i don't know over 200 kilograms which is which is not what i'm doing <laughs> right so just chasing the load and just trying to look at the progression in a strength way is not the way to go right sometimes i'm uh, no, the opinion that tension is just the key 
uh, the, should be the key focus for you. And tension can come with doing the same load with uh, maybe a better mind-muscle connection or so. That is progression in and for itself as well. And if you're then just doing the, the amount of volume and maybe adding a repetition here, that is already more volume for a specific muscle group or an entire muscle group, right? So, and this just adds up over time. You don't have to always put the load on the bar for each and every single movement and you don't have to expect from mesocycle to mesocycle even to put more load on the bar because on those exercises, it's simply not feasible because that would mean that everyone you, Steve, me, everyone who trains since like, I don't know, even 10 years or so would be so extremely strong and hardly anyone is, right? I I, I don't even, uh, I know someone who is able to do the entire stack on the lat pull down, but he's also close to 300 pounds, right? So uh, <laughs> that's an entire different thing. But I don't know anyone like you and I, Steve, who's capable of doing something like 100 kilograms on lat pull downs for repetitions clean and is at the same body weight such as us. But that would be the consequence if you always put load on the bar, but that's not how the reality actually is. So Yeah, I think it's it's only possible maybe for short stints, so maybe like a macro cycle, yeah. you can progress each mesocycle, but then you've kind of become stale and you have to then rotate and maybe that's where exercise yeah. selection and rotation comes in a little bit as well but it's really funny to me because i think a lot of the people who argue like about strength being super important and we argue maybe it's more of like a bonus of what comes along as a consequence of getting bigger is like oh look at these huge guys who lift really heavy weights and and i can even refer to like some of my clients like i've got a client right now who i can yeah Neil, <laughs> yeah. it's not, I'm not talking about Neil, but I have, oh, okay. I have a but client. He's strong. Yeah, he is strong. But I have a client right now who he he isn't very strong at like squats, for example. He has huge quads, very oh. impressive quads. Actually, I'm not well, Elias. It's not actually Elias, but maybe I have two <laughs> clients because I'm not sure Elias is a super strong squatter. Um, he's oh. he's proficient and does amazing squats, but he's not super strong at them. Um, but he has some of the biggest quads I've ever seen. So I think you can always bring up anecdote from these scenarios. And that's why I think generally going from a principles basis approach is normally best because I, oh, sorry, no, go I, ahead. I had nothing else to say. <laughs> I had it so often already that I was stronger than, than someone who was so much bigger than I was. And that was so frustrating because I was then questioning myself like, oh, I'm so much stronger. I'm squatting like 40 kilograms more, four repetitions than that guy. And still, I'm so much tinier than than him. And that is, I don't know, when strength would be the, the driver, right? Then the strongest people would always be the biggest people. But that's not the reality, right? Um, so yeah, uh, probably also a huge genetic compo yeah. um, component to it, but yeah, yeah, rambling. I think we're <laughs> probably done anyway. I think that was a yeah. good episode, hopefully, uh, and we had no child rape jokes, which is good. Yeah, that that is that is a positive actually. So yeah, we we are learning, we are getting better, we are better humans on a day to day basis. Um, yeah, it's it's sad though that you can't make jokes that are cruel, but that you're not allowed to because someone is offended. I, I can see why that is maybe overstepping boundaries for some and some may not laugh about it, but the world is just a cruel place. I, I'm, I'm more a positive guy, right? I think that the world is also a beautiful place. I think that um, you are just so biased by media that things are just like falling apart. But from statistics, Steven Pinker, check him out. We know that the world is get uh, is becoming a better and better place, statistically speaking, right? And we are just biased and influenced by the media. But um, if we are then not allowed to do jokes, which is just called parody as well and satire is it called satire mm -hmm. on, on english yeah um then in what a world will we live in if we can't make jokes about that um to get or see or get joy out of desperate situations this is what people and humans have always done always imagine people who live in a uh, warfare scenario right if they can't see 
beauty in something. And even if that's just a joke about the current situation, they are basically lost. All right. And yeah, go ahead. I just, what do you want to say? I, to not make this go too long, but I have a very yeah. short story. Um, it, me and I think my sister bought me and Charlotte for Christmas one year. It might have been like a couple of years ago. Um, tickets to a comedy sketch and pizza or something. And the comedy sketch was first went downstairs, and it was like lots of dark humor from one of the from one of the comedians and it did not go down well at all (laughs) it was like very dark and like he just kept going like he dug and he didn't get a good response and he just kept going darker and darker and darker and me and charlotte were just looking at each other like people are leaving because they're like this is too much um it was it was much worse than the jokes you had made (laughs) but and i mean it, it is like voldemort um, you just give power to the name in not talking out that name loudly. And this is the same, right? It doesn't... It uh, uh, So these things still happen, whether I talk about them positively or negatively. These things still happen. But I can decide to make, the, the, make um, something that is very cruel and not entertaining at least a little bit joyful for me because it doesn't change whether it happens or not, but I could see it in a negative way or I can see it in a positive way. And I decide for myself to always try to have a joyful life because whether or not I see it as a joyful life, um, uh, whether or not I actually see it negatively or not, it is happening. It doesn't change. Yeah, I think there's a difference in finding, making light of a situation versus thinking that a situation is a joke. I don't think you think yeah. that that is a joke. No, that, that's a very no, serious absolutely. thing, but you're making light of it to make it kind of have a flip positive impact rather than always just a negative. So Very well said. I have two children now at home and fuck, of course I don't want them to get raped. Holy shit. And I don't want any one of our listeners' kids to get raped. And I hope that no one is listening who'd ever experienced anything remotely like yeah. this. Right, but still, it freaking happens. Right, and this is so, so you put it very well there in perspective. I want to try and leave on a, a light note. Have we got anything exciting happening apart from Cliff is obviously coming over, uh, yeah, which Cliff. is hopefully the listeners heard Cliff and he is was a friend. He's a fantastic presenter, just like he has a child as well, right? Yes, he does. Uh, yeah. I think this is going to be his first time in the UK, so yeah. that's going to be quite nice. And hopefully, we can yeah dig his brain a little bit. I'm very curious when like spending time with some of these people is always really great because you see insights into how their brain works like with mike it was always very interesting and especially experienced guys Mm. it's just i don't know i i find experience so sexy because i mean not that i'm attracted (laughs) to cliff but um, it's just it gives you an entirely different perspective on things because there are things that you can learn from uh, books and I don't know, on studying or so, but there are just things that you only can learn by experience. And if someone else has already that experience, he can share that with you, which is so valuable in my opinion. Yep. Awesome. Guys, cool. thank you very much for listening. And uh, Paul will be back with you next week. <laughs>